So as you guys join our virtual stage, I'm going to introduce Lindsay Manna, who is the SVP of Strategic Partnerships and Global Business at Aria NLG. And her background includes a career focused around her two biggest passions, technology and business strategy. At Aria NLG, she is currently working to bring customers a strategy geared approach through the power of natural language generation. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Lindsay Manna, who is going to be our panel moderator for today. And I'm going to hand the mic over to you, Lindsay, and have you kick off this discussion. Great, thank you everyone, and thanks for having me. So it's an absolute pleasure today, um, as Charlene said, to be discussing how technology literacy can empower data literacy and enterprise decision-making. We are so fortunate to have an expert panel gathered today. So we'll take a quick moment for Pradeepta, Alan, and Marius uh, to introduce yourselves to the virtual audience here today. Thanks, Lindsay. I'm Pradeepta Saha. I work for the Estelle Order companies. Um, and uh, my role with Estelle Order is uh, I lead business insights and analytics for our global supply chain. I've been with Estelle Order for just over a year right now. And prior to this, I had the privilege of working with uh, Mondelez International, better known for their brands like Oreo and Cadbury outside of the US. Um, but I did spend most of my uh, working life at Procter & Gamble prior to this and mostly in analytics. So I'm pretty glad to be here on this panel. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Lindsay, Alan Thompson. I'm with the Hanover Insurance Group. I'm the VP of Enterprise Data and Analytics. <clears throat> prior to, uh, I've been at Hanover about two years. Prior to Hanover, I was with Bank of America for almost 24 years, building, managing data and analytics groups across almost every one of their lines of business. I'm happy to be here today. Thanks, Alan. I'm Marius Mascovici. I'm the founder and CEO of Metric Insights. Uh, we are a, a, a BI governance and user engagement platform for Portal. Uh, and uh, uh, prior to Metric Insights, I uh, we worked in a variety of organizations, Oracle, uh, a data warehouse consulting company uh, for uh, 20 years. So I've been around for a long time. <laughs> Thanks, Marius. So I, I got the pleasure of speaking with the panelists about this topic uh, before today's session. And even on our preparation, uh, for, for those of you in the, in the audience today, we got really excited about this topic. So um, let's talk, start just by framing out what we're gonna talk about today, which is literacy. Um, and as we think about literacy, it's not just the ability to read and write and, and you know, consume information, but it really refers to, uh, in, in my opinion, being educated in a specific knowledge area. So not only being able to receive that information, but to be knowledgeable in that information um, to allow for comprehension, for data comprehension. So to fully democratize data literacy, we've got to capture that knowledge expertise and allow that to be accessible by any constituent throughout the organization, right? Regardless of, of what your knowledge level is, you want to be empowered with that knowledge. So today we're going to talk about, as Charlene um, queued it up, both technology literacy, as well as what we're calling and the panelists are calling intelligent data literacy and why both are important to empowering the articulate enterprise. So the first question for the panel um, and, and any of the panelists, feel free to feel free to answer. I won't pick on anyone in specific, but what does it mean to you to be intelligently data literate? So for us, I think, you know, when we look at data literacy, it, it's really intelligence is all about sort of having the context. You know, when you're looking at a particular um, analysis or a particular piece of information as a consumer, if you don't have the necessary context in order to understand what you're looking at, then by definition, you're not literate. You know, you, of course, you can look at the numbers and know, oh, it's, I can see that this number is going up and going down. But if I don't understand what that number really represents, all the way to the nuances uh, associated with that, then how can I say that I'm literate on now? All I'm just doing is sort of fumbling. Yeah, no, it's, a, it's a great point. Sorry, go ahead, Alan. Oh, so in at Hanover, again, we've got we've created literacy levels, right? So again, we're looking for everyone in the company to have a base, you know, base knowledge of data and analytics up to data scientists, which are the most advanced. And, and it, you know, 
a lot of it, again, is, is the content, right? Or context, I'm sorry. And, and even going back a little further to data dictionaries, right? We're trying to make sure that people understand how to use the data. You know what I mean? Because that, that's a big part in, in driving a lot of the downstream analytics and everything else. So just being comfortable with it uh, is, is really important. Pradeep, anything to add there? Yeah, and I agree with you know, what has been said so far. And um, you know, what I would add uh, there is, let, let me give an example, right? Uh, I'm building on what Maria has just said. Uh, so let's say you want to, you know, you, you want to you want to know how much did your plant produce, right? And you could even know that, okay, I can get the number from this report, which tells me that this is my output at an SKU level for the plant. However, as you get deeper into that, from the point about the so-called nuances, um, you may start asking, but wait a minute, does that include samples? Does that uh, count um, bundle packs or combo packs you know, twice, once as the base product and once again as, um, as, as, the, as the combined SKU? Now, the reason that's important is because the true data literacy means asking the question to yourself about why do I need that data? What is the, what is the purpose? before either claiming to have the data or asking for data very, very broadly. Right? Because that means that you've really understood not just the process, but also why you have that question. Because the purpose of which you're gonna use that is gonna dictate you know, what that output at the plant really means. And it's, it's a great point. So we talk about what happened, but what happened is, as uh, everyone's been talking about here, why or how did that happen, but then is it really relevant from a contextual perspective to what I like to call the so what, what's next? What do I do now with that information? And so I, I couldn't agree more without that uh, context, you can't make intelligent business decisions, which uh, certainly uh, is what it means to be intelligently data literate, as we've been saying. So a follow on question to this, which is really important, is why is it important to enable that level of data literacy with that contextualization? Uh, what's the importance of that? Um, you know, within your businesses and, and you feel within the enterprise? Why is that so critical to enable this? If I may build on that, I think, you know, I think you already answered the question partly um, uh, yeah. with the previous question's answers, right? Which is obviously you could drive the wrong decisions if you don't have that literacy, you haven't sought to build that literacy. Now, typically, and hopefully that doesn't happen because again, as a otherwise literate person, uh, which you know, managers are typically are, you would spot the, the problem at some point in time and not take a bad decision based on the wrong, wrong meaning of the data. However, very simply, imagine the amount of time that is going in this process. So if you know, speed of decision-making, productivity, if these are you know, uh, obvious, obviously valid concerns, uh, these really get impacted when you do not have the um, the, the literacy uh, that uh, that is that is sort of you know, almost basic. And as companies get more data driven, right? You're using more data and to make to make informed, hopefully, business decisions. And sometimes you're bringing in data that you've never seen before, right? So sometimes you don't have that historical context. Is this right or wrong? Right? Am I am I going left or right? Am I making the right decision? So. Again, without that kind of common sense and, and context, um, you know, uh, you've got to have that as, as we move faster and faster with more and more data. I think another, another thing, and I think Alan sort of touched on it earlier, but I think when we look at this concept of literacy, I think we should also be thinking about sort of the persona through which um, the, the information is being consumed. So, you know, for example, data, this kind of literacy means something completely different in some respect to the, the analyst or the, the data scientist who's trying to, to work with the data, who, who really needs to understand uh, you know, a, a detailed un, a chronology, lineage, you know, down to the that side of how does this data fold in? What are the business rules that are associated with it from a mechanical perspective, what's happening downstream? Uh, that, that is a little bit different than perhaps the end consumer of the information that really needs to understand the business rules, the, at a high level, the, the again does want to know about lineage, but probably not at the same level of detail as the analyst. And so it, it's really about kind of it, it, providing the the person based on where they are, where they sit in the organization, and the persona, and the way they consume the information, with the right granularity of contextual information, so they can make intelligent judgments about the about the data. 
Yeah, and I think Marius, you've actually just covered the next question that I had set up. So I've almost, almost we're answering our next questions as we're continuing to talk, which is great. But um, it's about that unlocking knowledge inside of all constituents, which is what you're talking about there, Marius. And, and Alan, you were touching on that too, experts and non-experts. So to really understand what's the best decision for a business as a whole, um, you've got different groups of people with different levels of knowledge. And uh, Marius mentioned you have data scientists all the way to you know, managers to you know, C-level executives. And everybody needs to benefit from that same level of knowledge and information, but not everyone has the same level of expertise. They have different areas of expertise, different areas of knowledge. So that actually was the next question. It was how does democratizing data literacy empower everyone in the enterprise? And I think we really just touched on that. Um, because say it's somebody in, in logistics or, or in, in different areas of the business, being able to have the knowledge um, through, through communication and through data literacy of another person in the organization that you're not, you're not meant to have the knowledge, but then you're able to share in that knowledge. Um, that's the whole point. And I think we've really, we've really just touched on that. But anything else to add? We're going to do a slight shift in, in our conversation to technology, but anything else to add that we've covered a lot so far? Well, I was just going to say again, de democratization of data is a double-edged sword, right? So if I start with the lowest level data architects and data engineers down to all of a sudden somebody getting a finalized product, right? There's this level of knowledge that's lost each time we pass that to a different person. So, um, you know, it can be a double-edged sword if somebody's done something in the middle of that process that isn't right. The person that consumes it at the end might not realize it, right? Because so it's passed through so many years. So you know, we, we struggle with that a lot because, again, you, you the more you democratize data, the more versions of things you can get. So it's a it, it, it can get a little bit dicey if you're not careful. Yeah, I think that's right. And he, I'll put his finger right on it. It's really becomes a governance issue there, right? right. Like, okay, the data is democratized, but how do you make sure that those definitions? are captured by the right people. So as you were talking about there, the Lindsay, there are some members of that ecosystem that are producing information towards data literacy that no one wants to know about the lineage. They're documenting it, they're documenting business terms. And so it, it's really about making sure that there's a clear role and definition for who's gonna be doing that, to governance around that process. And then, the, and then it's being delivered in such a way that then the consumers of that content can, whether that consumer is a new analyst that is trying to build a report or build a, 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 a data pipeline needs to know kind of what is the data and how do I get it, which data set should I use, or whether that's a, uh, a line manager looking at a, at a dashboard or a KPI and wants to understand what's, what are they really looking at, that, that it's consumable um, to both of those folks. Yeah, and so part of data important. literacy is making sure, as you're saying, Marius, that the way in which you communicate facilitates comprehension. So in order to make someone data literate, you have to make sure that you're speaking to them in a way that they can have comprehension. And so I think you're touching on something really important there, the way that we empower a data scientist, for example, with data literacy in an enterprise would be different than how we're empowering a line manager, a C-level executive, et cetera. So um, it's about, you, you don't wanna send them the same messages you're sending to the data science. It's a different delivery mechanism, a different way to communicate and a different way to empower data literacy based off where they sit in the organization. And I think that's really important because otherwise, as you're saying, Alan, not only could the message be wrong, but it could be lost because it's not being communicated in a way that that person can understand. Um, so it's, it's important to have that alignment. Pradeep, do anything else to add, add there? Yeah, I mean, you know, when we talk of data democratization, I honestly believe that, um, you know, it, it's, it's not a universal franchise. It is still going to be a, call it franchise based on literacy, right? It is not to say that, oh, you can't get the data because you're level 3B or whatever, you need to be level 4A to not have the data. No, that's not the point. The point is that, well, with the data comes the responsibility of understanding it, using it well. And you will never get to a point, especially in large companies, where you can make the whole world data literate in terms of your definition, because no matter what, there are so many nuances, so many subtleties. But what you can build is this understanding that you need to understand the data. What you can build is subject matter experts and you know, experts in, in, in the data field. You know, we have SMEs for everything, for, you know, for planning, for marketing, for sales. So you know, why not for data? And you would know that, okay, when I want to get to a level which exceeds my current level of literacy, I recognize that and I reach out you know, to these individuals or maybe to technologies, uh, right? Maybe we're seeing technology playing that space as well. 
which then allow me to you know, close that gap that I have and get to the level of literacy I need to be able to exploit this data you know, uh, in, in the right way. Oh, perfect, perfect segue, Pripta. Thank you for that. Uh, to, to the next topic. Um, so we're, we're shifting slightly here of, okay, we're talking about data literacy, but in order to enable data literacy, we've got to make sure we have the right access to the right technology. So being technology literate um, is equally as important uh, and critical to data literacy empowerment. Um, so how do we how do we bridge that gap between business leaders uh, and not just business leaders, but 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 uh, different constituents, understanding of the data, understanding those requirements, but then finding the supporting technologies that are going to make that possible. And what we find is that sometimes the business doesn't even know what technology is available, and so then they don't know that they can actually evolve access to intelligent data literacy. And if they don't know it's possible, they don't know they have a problem. So they think, well, you know, this is just the way it is. And this is the information I have access to. And so the, my, my process is just fine. But if you're technology illiterate and you don't have that technology literacy of what's available to you to become data literate, you're, you're in this kind of this, uh, this uh, you know, uh, hamster wheel of not knowing that, that things can change. And, and so um, how do we bridge that gap between technology literacy that then empowers data literacy, where do we start? Feels well, overwhelming. <laughs> well, so, so again, a lot of it with us at Hanover is we've started in, incorporating tools into this. So like basic things like data dictionaries, IGC, things like Alteryx, where we can empower more people to be able to play with data and use, like people that aren't used to writing code to get data, they can actually kind of see data and play with data in a, in a, in a pretty easy way. Um, you know, things like that, BI tools, right? Be, you know, using Power BI and, and, and Tableau, things like that. It just gets more people involved in that whole kind of playing and touching and, uh, you know, like, you, 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 you know, so, so a lot of it is just getting them involved, right? Uh, that, that it's not some big mystery black box of the data warehouse or whatever. They can actually kind of get involved in it and play with it so they understand it more. That's kind of the approach we've taken. Yeah, technology makes it accessible. Having these exactly. tools on board make it accessible for more people. Right. It, exactly. And it's really and kind of as Alan alluded, I think it's a pairing of technology with the right processes internally, right? Because for example, you may have a, a data catalog such as Alation or Calibra out there in your environment, but if you if you're not uh, actively using that in, in a way, you know, it, there's not a process by which things need to actually make it in there, get documented. And then if there's not a process by which that information gets socialized broadly within the organization, if it's not accessible to users at the point at which they're using those Power BI or Tableau or dashboards that, that use that information, then it's sort of all for naught, right? You've written a bunch of definitions, but those definitions are buried somewhere where, where uh, consumers of that might not be able to find it. So, so what processes are there? Are there? And then there's, a, there's also part of the processing is generating awareness. And uh, you know, as, as you alluded to, Lindsay, if, if the organization does not know that uh, where the information exists, if they don't know which technologies are available to them to solve specific problems, then, then that's already a fail. It doesn't matter how much, in fact, it's a whole bunch of wasted effort that went into that process. So making sure that there's that there's a, a whole engagement uh, paradigm that's built into whatever solution you have, whether it's technical, it's not just not about technology, it's about process as well. It's critical so that you can reach people and let them know, hey, there's some things we want you to learn about, and here's where you go to learn about them. Yeah, because you serve up all that technology, and and you gave the example of business intelligence and, and Alteryx, which are very powerful tools, but you serve that to them, and then there's more data or there's visuals and you know, how do we make sure, as you're saying, Marius, that that's delivered in a way that people can consume? So that process of saying, this is where you go to get it, this is how you can receive it, and then are you consuming it in, you know, text messages or emails or, you know, presentations or PDFs, whatever that is, how do, how do you make that consumable? So um, there, we focus there, a lot on that our, at ARIA for sure. And, and that's a key part, right? You can have all these technologies there, but how do you make sure they're used in, in processes and then consumable? And how is it easy, right? Like it has, in order for it to be consumable by most people organization, you've got to make it really, really easy. It's got to be sort of one place you find all the information. It's got to be incredibly accessible, right? Because we as human beings just won't look very hard. Yeah. Marius, what you said hits the nail on the head, right? Because a lot of people don't know what they don't know. And some of these things tend to be the best kept secret because they're small groups that use them. So we've had like 
quarterly data and analytics kind of community meetings with, you know, hundreds of people where we can introduce them to these things, show them case studies, have everything centralized on a website so they don't have to go searching all over the place for it to find these things. But that the communication and education are huge because, again, uh, if people don't know about it, it you know, the, you said like best kept secret, I mean, people can't use this stuff and they're not comfortable with it. Yeah, pretty up to anything to add there. You covered a lot of ground. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, a typical, you know, take an example, a typical situation I've seen is where, you know, somebody in the management will say that, well, our data is really bad because I've looked at the same KPI on three different reports and I get three different numbers, right? Um, you know, in reality, the data is not bad. What has actually happened is that what you've done to the data in those three different reports are different things, but you've used the same you know, English language term to capture it. You've called it sales, for example. And, um, you know, what I think many companies are doing now uh, is um, really enforcing those very strict definitions via our enterprise-wide process, which says that if you have a metric or a KPI, this is a process that we follow. And we're not allowing anyone from having a different version of that KPI, but you've got to name it differently, right? Now, what I would wish for, and I've seen that as yet, is technology that would actually enforce using those standard names, right? And that, to me, would, you know, remove half of this problem, right? And it would really focus on, uh, you know, going, back to, going back to the original question that we started with, you know, in what context are you using the data? Because that should influence what metric or what KPI you're looking at and not just looking at the sales from the dashboard because it is there, because that might not be what you really need. Yeah, aligning to those data dictionaries that Alan was talking about, right? Yeah, no, it's really, really important because, you know, it's, you could get different insights and different, uh, different conclusions from, as you're saying, pretty to the same data. So uh, that could be dangerous. Some of the things, again, as, as we democratize this more and more, you have different versions of the truth. So one of the things we've, you know, started using within like Power BI is, they're, they have ways to kind of certify, right? A dashboard that it's been produced by the right group and, that, and the numbers have been validated. So part of this is making sure that, and that goes back to what Maria said about governance, right? We're making sure that we put these things in place so that we don't have 50 dashboards that are supposed to be all saying the same thing and they all have a different number. So part of it is just enforcement of those governance rules. Yeah, cr Certification, critical. I think it's critical. And as is sort of the, what, what uh, uh, people mentioned that, you know, being able to associate those enterprise KPIs to the objects that you're looking at so that you understand, you know, what are the, the agreed upon definitions that have been actually used and applied in a particular piece of visualization. And then, and then making all that accessible. If you can do that in a way that is consistently, you know, across all the different assets you have, then I think you've got a big jump start in people having that, that understanding because it's like, if you think about literacy just as a concept, right? To be literate by definition, you must understand. And when we are reading something, you know, just basic literacy, right? If we see a, a word we don't understand, well, what do we do? We go either to a dictionary, Google it, you know, figure out what, what does this mean? What is the definition? So that same kind of paradigm must by definition exist in, in our enterprise environments around data. Otherwise we can, users will never be literate because by definition they'll come in and they will not, never have a complete understanding of all the vocabulary that's used in that particular visualization. Uh, it's it's a great point, and it was uh, we, we're we're having we don't even need to ask questions because the session's just uh, evolving itself right through these questions. But so we were all prepared. But it it goes into what technology supports data literacy because we're talking about nuances of technology here that are really important. So the data dictionaries, the knowledge the knowledge banks or knowledge knowledge capture. Um, uh, areas of saying, well, this is the knowledge base that we have. This is our data dictionary. This is how you use that. Um, and so, Alan, you started talking about, you know, Power BI and, and data dictionaries. What does that look like? And I'm actually going to combo the two questions that I had here because I think it will help fill out this section of our talk. Because years ago, um, years and years ago, uh, and even going back to when I first started in the NLG space in 2011, 2012, even through to 2014, 2015, 2016 even, um, data wasn't available. So we were creating a lot of data, but it wasn't readily available. And when it was, it was so compartmentalized and in, in such a data silo that you really couldn't get that as we started talking about in the beginning, that contextualized view of the business. So I'm kind of comboing the two questions of, we know where we were in the past, where are we today? And some companies are not 
where other companies are today. And that's okay. It's an, it's an evolution and everyone's catching up to where we can be today. Um, what has changed in the landscape? And then what are those technologies that we can use to really facilitate that? So I've kind of flip-flopped the two questions that I had in order there, because I think that it's important to know that, you know, and to talk about first, we need to have access to that data, right? To tell that contextualized story, we've got to have that access to that data and what technologies are available to enterprises today um, that'll facilitate this. And it's, a, it's quite the stack of technologies. It's not just ever one thing. It's, it's a combination of technologies that empower this or enable this. Well, you know, the biggest mistake I think a lot of times is companies have to understand what their strategy is before you start thinking about what technology do I need? What data do I need? Right. So I'll give you, for instance, like in banking years ago, they got out of pushing products. Like everybody needed a checking account. Everybody, you know, we would sell into a persona. A person was a certain age. They were at a life stage cluster. So they would need these certain things. Insurance, on the other hand, is still very kind of product driven, right? It's very siloed. So we don't get that kind of view of the customer. And it, it goes to what you talked about of, we end up building these silos of data. So we don't get that holistic view of our customer, or our business, right? And then I've got a data expert in each silo. So what we've been trying to do is break those down to an enterprise level using a data dictionary to, to document all of our data. So different silos would use it in a different way, but we still have to have that holistic view at an enterprise level of, you know, what is the data that's available to us and how do where I report out? But the, the great part is there's so many tools now that didn't exist even five years ago to consolidate data, to document data, you know, data for data dictionaries and, and, and visual tools to explore data. So I think a lot of it gets back to what is our strategy as a company, right? And how does data fit into that? Because, and the other thing that has always been amazing to me is data usually is an afterthought. Let's go buy something because it's got cool features and functions. Then we'll figure out what we need out of it after we collect it. So a lot of it I think it's back to what is our strategy? And that's going to drive a lot of the technology that we buy to support that strategy rather than buying stuff, then trying to figure out our strategy. Well, you said something that made everybody smile here, Alan, was don't let it be an afterthought um, in terms of, of, of data accessibility and organizing that data. Think about your business strategy first right. and then don't be you know, scrambling to say, oh, well, we really needed that. And it would have been great if we had that. So I saw everybody had a reaction to that comment because a lot of times I think we see companies fall into that. So uh, Mary, we, so we tend to collect data, then try to figure out what we're going to do with it. Or we don't think about what do I need out of this after I implement it, right? And so we end up with all these ETL processes to strap things together and it kind of gets messy. So I think it's very important to think about what do we really need before we get too far down the path. Yeah, no, it's, it's a great point. I think that's a great point. You have to begin with the end in mind, right? right. Well, as as always, it was always the case. It's quite famously said. But I think that the the uh, the thing is, from a technology perspective, there are, as really Alan alluded to, there are many more levers you get to pull. So the BI tools themselves have implemented uh, some governance within them. So, for example, Power BI, Tableau, others have certification capabilities right within the tool. There's some basic lineage capabilities you can display right within the tool. There are, of course, the data catalogs, I think, have a big uh, uh, role to play. So whether Alation or Calibra, there's open source data catalog technologies that have come out of out, out of Uber and, and, and uh, I think uh, Netflix and lots of other places that you can use. They, they do lots of interesting things. You know, they'll mine ETL processes. They'll you know, uh, they'll look at the uh, and automatically identify classification for data, identify what data has PII, uh, can ingest pulling content from, uh, from the uh, underlying uh, BI tools themselves and allow you to enrich the metadata there. And then there's solutions like, like ones we provide with, with portal solutions where you can kind of pull that all together and deliver it uh, to the end user uh, in, a, in a way that then, you know, makes it accessible to everyone. So, there's a whole stack there, and it's really it, the, the, it can be overwhelming sometimes based on how many different uh, technologies are there. I, and I think the right approach is to take what I said is to say, well, what are we really trying to accomplish? What are the priority, priorities that we have? Yeah. And then what options do we have in the technologies we already have in our stack? What do we need to fill in the gap for? And then what's the best uh, uh, thing that really fits into that gap that will, will give us the bang for our buck? Maybe we can also talk about the stacks that you're using. So, I mean, Alan, you talked a little bit about, you know, uh, you know, day in the life at Hanover, Pradeepta. What are some of the stacks that you're using, Nestle Lauder? How, do, how is that helping support data literacy within your organization? Well, we are, uh, 
I think, I mean, uh, I can't speak a lot about that because uh, we have a separate team which is very much focused on data management uh, at the enterprise level. That's one of the, I think, big interventions we have made as a company to really have focused um, data management at enterprise level. Uh, from a more of a stakeholder user point of view, you know, what I do see is, again, a lot of effort going behind smart data dictionaries to uh, to make sure that we at least know what we're defining and getting those alignments and, and, and documenting them. Uh, we um, are you know, in the process of experimenting with many of these uh, tools which allow you to query your data without needing to know SQL or without even needing to know how to pull facts and dimensions from and build a pivot table, uh, essentially expressing your needs and national language, whether it's English or any other language, and being able to get, get the answers. Um, and, you know, we're using Power BI heavily, and um, again, you have to be a little bit technically literate to, um, uh, to appreciate some of the Power BI capabilities. But again, the fact that um, you can actually see the entire lineage when you are looking at a dashboard, um, and that I think is amazing. Right? Uh, and, and, and that gives you a very good sense of where you have a big risk because the number of you know, spreadsheets or SharePoint site feeding data versus where you can see the data is coming from a trusted source and therefore you can trust the trust the output. Uh, so that's uh, pretty much what I see from a, call it, user or stakeholder point of view. And yeah, there's a common denominator there. Um, you know, Marius, you were talking about a portal, a, a single place for people to go. Uh, Pradeep, you were alluding to kind of a, you know, a, a, a no code, I don't have to be too technical I don't have to be, you know, a data scientist or analyst or even know how to use Power BI. And I think that that's a theme that we're hearing here today is that you know, in order to, you can't make it a uh, mandatory requirement to be, uh, you, 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 can, you have to be technology literate to know the technology exists, right? But it can't be a mandatory requirement to have to know how to use all of these tools because if that then becomes a requirement, then you've got this gap of, well, different, different people are gonna have different knowledge bases, different people are gonna have different capability levels, and we can't let the, the technology in which they know how to use, uh, you know, limit their ability to understand data, right? So that's, that's a key thing that I'm hearing here is that we, we can't let that be the, be the deciding factor of, you know, if, uh, you know, Sam and Mrs., you know, Lindsay's ability to understand data is limited by her ability to use technology. We can't have that be the relationship. So um, I think that's too something that's coming coming out here in our discussion, which is really important. I Accessibility. Think, like, I think an, an apt analogy for this is if you think about sort of the experience of literacy with using like a device like a Kindle versus um, a traditional book. Right, like if, if you're reading a book on paper, you, you you run run across a word you don't understand. You now have to go through the effort of where's my dictionary? Oh, I got oh, I got to Google this and find it. There's a whole bunch of work, and so, a lot of people just sort of skip over it. If if you've got the Kindle, you just sort of tap on that word, and the definition comes up there, and you immediately know what it is, and you keep on reading. Well, that's a different experience, and that experience promotes data literacy, whereas the other experience really does not. The traditional reading experience is not because it requires a whole lot more effort. So I think it's to your point, Lindsay. It's got to all be integrated in a way where I get the insights, the the, the contextual information that I need right there as I'm ex as I'm working with a particular analytic, or as I'm trying to, to do my regular job searching for content, whatever it is, or searching for an analytic to find uh, to be able to build an, a, a report. It can't be something that's divorced from that whole experience and flow that I'm. A lot of it comes down to roles based, right? Again, if I'm a casual user or a business user, or a, you know what I mean, it, a lot of it depends on what I'm doing. If I'm a data scientist, I'm using R or Python. If I'm a business analyst, I'm using something like Alteryx. I'm accessing the same data, but with a different level of, you know, competency in terms of you know what I'm doing. So a lot of it is let's use this you know, technology to enable people to do their job where it sits, right? I don't need a data scientist using Alteryx and I don't want a casual business user using R because it, it, it doesn't fit. Do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah. It goes back to the, you know, it's not a universal franchise. You have to have certain level of interest and skills based right. on what you're trying to do. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and it plays into, well, when is data literacy most valuable to an organization? Well, it's most valuable when you actually completely collapse that distance, that distance between my ability to use technology, the knowledge, uh, you know, it's not just a click on the Kindle, it's, 
you know, is that really accessible to me? And, and, and the ability to communicate to that constituent and, and completely collapsing that to instant accessibility that's communicated in a way I understand, that's where it becomes more and more value. The, you know, the, the, the level of value increases there, right? If, if I'm a data, data scientist, well, you know, I really understand data. That's my job. I'm, I'm, you know, as you said, Ellen, I understand how to use Alteryx or I understand how to use these tools. That, that distance between uh, comprehension and, and the ability to take intelligent action, um, that distance is, is smaller because you have that capability. And I think where it becomes more valuable, and I guess I'm answering my own question, but to talk about it, you know, when does that, when does that become most valuable um, to an organization? I think we were just touching on it there. Um, you know, when is this most valuable and to what groups within the organization? I think the other piece of it though is the magnitude of the problem you're solving. So for instance, if I'm pricing a book of business and insurance and I'm in a, and I have a data scientist in a room explaining the model and I see all these heads going up and down and these people have no idea what they're talking about, but you're, you're, you're building a model pricing a billion dollar book of business. And if you're off by a little bit, so, so part of it is not just that the data scientist knows what they're doing and they build it, but it's the kind of literacy, the, the competence of the people in the room that the business people that are agreeing to something and they really don't know what they're agreeing to. Right. So, so that's where you kind of get, you, it's, it's a little bit, it, it gets a little bit dicey with, in terms of when you're making these de decisions, it is how big of a how big of a problem could this be for our business if if somebody misinterprets or doesn't understand what they're agreeing to? So, you know, so that's what I worry about, to be honest with you. That's one of the bigger issues we have is that without that literacy, without that competence, without people understanding what they're agreeing to or what went into what's going to drive the business for the next two years, um, they, it can run into uh, you know signing up for things you didn't you didn't intend to sign up for. Yeah. We're in contemplation about that one. That's a that's that's serious, right? So, um, and it's it's absolutely true. Um, and and kind of that misinformation or misinterpretation. And I think it goes back to a few things we've talked about today: the data dictionaries and really understanding what that data is trying to say. What do we mean by X, Y, or Z at, at an organization? Uh, but then that consistent communication um, of that uh, is is absolutely critical. Um, kind of a final question here, and I'm not sure, uh, Charlene, how much more time we have here, but um, how do we get started to enhance this? If I'm, you know, um, you know, company ABC now, and, and I have certain things in place, uh, what's the next best steps um, that organizations can take? I think, Alan, you've, you've discussed many times the data dictionary. I agree that's critical. And Marius was referring to the ability to look into that data dictionary to validate literacy or to confirm literacy. Um, which is critical, but what other steps can companies take today to facilitate data literacy and technology literacy? Where do you go to go to make sure that you're both technology literate and data literate? I can tell you what we did at Hanover. We took a step back and we went through like LinkedIn learning and came up with a basic data analytics literacy program and a technology one. So it's kind of one of those things. It's the basis level that everybody really should, you know, a chip to get in the game, right? Everybody kind of has to know this stuff. But a lot of it was just to get that base and then build on that in terms of the traits we look for, as well as the, you know, the harder skills that we're looking for as we move up the, the pyramid of, you know, people touching data. But we just kept it simple at the beginning was communication and, and, and basic knowledge and then try to be more specific with career pathing um, and, and jobs training based on the role the person was in. Right. Uh, so that's kind of how we started. Then there's all the tools like, the, you know, all these other tools we've talked about that enhance this over time. But a lot of it was just training and communication, just getting people comfortable with the concepts um, to try to figure out, you know, where do we go from here? Yeah, education. And, and I think it, it kind of comes back to what we were talking about before, the, where I think that needs to be aligned around a, a persona-based approach. So you want to really look at the personas in your organization, you want to prioritize where data literacy is most important. Is it, you know, in the case of what Alan was talking about, that, hey, it's, I got to get the literacy of the business unit area where in this particular area, because that we're making all these decisions and we can be making mistakes. Is it a broad brush stroke where I need to get everyone across the organization more engaged with analytics and understanding what's going on and making smart decisions? Um, you know, who are we are, is it, is it the middle tier data scientists? You know, and so based on that, crafting a strategy and then looking only after that at technologies and solutions that support it, because that way you can't, you can't possibly boil the ocean 
in this kind of situation, you can't, you know, wave a magic wand or take your fingers and say, you know, now all of a sudden I've transformed literacy in your organization, but you can make a difference in a particular narrow area and you can then build off of that success going forward. So I think figuring out where the, the big bang for the buck is going to be is, is the key. Yeah. Pretty tough. Yeah, if I'm add to that, uh, you know, I think technology helps definitely. Um, so even, even simple things like being able to just categorize and classify the hundreds of dashboards and reports that you might have in the organization and being able, and providing people the way to search for the right content. You know, those are the things that obviously help a lot. But having said that, um, I think a lot of simple things uh, that I've seen being very powerful uh, in terms of how do you educate uh, the population without having to roll out training for thousands of employees is often starting at the top. What I've seen is being very successful is just you know, spending 10 minutes with a reverse mentor and a senior leader and, and uh, helping them understand why certain things are important. And when they in turn start asking questions, whenever they see data on a slide, where did the data come from? What is the source, right? What are assumptions? It very quickly becomes a cascading practice throughout the organization. And that to me is, you know, is so powerful in driving that, um, call it culture change or behavior change, that it really smooths the way for people who are trying to you know, build this whole data literacy. Right? So yeah, in short, I think you know, the, the process and culture, um, you know, those sort of interventions are, you know, are probably where you start. You know, and technology obviously helps, but, but I wouldn't start with technology. One other advantage though, Lindsay, too nowadays is you know, a lot of early in careers are coming out of college much more advanced you know, with data and technology. So it kind of, as you start to build from the bottom or, or you start to bring new people in the organization, they're already thinking like that, right? So so it, it's a real advantage, I think, nowadays where you've got a lot more people coming into the organizations that are comfortable with this stuff. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, let's see, um, I'm just checking to see, Charlene, if there were any questions. I'm just looking over in the chat because I know we have uh, just three more minutes left. Um, let's see, no questions so far from the audience. Um, thanks, Charlene, I just saw your note. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, in wrapping this up, because we just have two, three minutes left, I think that it's a combination of things. I think what Pradeep to what you hit on right there at the end was critical. What's driving the business to become data literate? So what, what are those business drivers is a really important area to start. What are we trying to extract from the data? Um, what are what's key information that would help us drive intelligent business decisions? And understanding that helps, as you said, cascade down into: Do we have the data? Right, starting at the core, do we have that data? What can we do to make that data accessible? Who does that data need to be communicated to? Right, and so uh, it's it's the exact process that we do uh, here at Aria. Same thing when we're doing natural language generation. It's really understanding what's important to you. Uh, what's important to understand about what's important to you from a language perspective? What do you need to know? Why is that important? Why do you care? And what are we going to highlight and when? When is this information important to you? Certain information is important at certain stages of, of a business process or certain stages of a business. So I don't just want to know everything all the time. I want to know things that are, you know, mission critical, you know, action oriented to my business. And so it's not, you know, just throw me insights, just throw me information, make me data literate and throw me everything. It's throw is deliver, throw might not be the right word, deliver me the information that, um, now I'm just picturing things being thrown at somebody, uh, <laughs> deliver me the information I need to know when I need to know it um, and, and do that in a way that, that can facilitate uh, efficiency and productivity and intelligent action. So um, I think that was a, a really great wrap up there, Pradeepta, because everything we've been talking about, you've got to start with what's most important to the business and then let the technology and the literacy facilitate that end goal. And, and Marius, you said the, the age old phrase begin with the end in mind, right? So um, really what, what is the business need and then researching how do we deliver that? So so all, all great points. Um, I think a lot of times too, I think uh, Alan, you said this, I'm forgetting who said this, you don't know what you don't know. Uh, I see that a lot in natural language generation. I, you know, 10 years ago, nobody knew what those three letters meant. Now more people do, but not everybody, but um, you know, facilitating data literacy, technology literacy through education. Um, but of course, understanding what the business needs first and then educating them on what can solve their business problem. Uh, absolutely 
uh, is the right way to go. So it's just been an absolute pleasure speaking to everybody today. Uh, warm uh, thank you uh, to, to Marius, Pradeepta, Allen, and thank you so much, Charlene, for being a fantastic host. Uh, pleasure speaking with everyone today. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye.